motivation is easy. I think when you're representing your country, there's no motivation required whatsoever. Every time you walk out into the middle, uh, you walk down the race, you walk out of the change room, and you get yeah, the crowd erupts, and you're ready for battle. Onto sport's most traditional stage stepped a unique personality. Extroverted, showy, contentious, but above all, astonishingly gifted. In a decade of absolute extremes, he would inflame cricketing passions wherever the game would be played. Reaching back into history, he dusted off the ancient art of leg spinning and revived it as a magical act, bewildering the best batsmen of the era. All the while, the spotlight tracked him from the summits of triumph to the clamor of controversy and back again. Whatever the occasion, the game has never seen anything quite like Shane Keith Warne. Over the years I've tried to be myself and I know not everyone likes me but I like to think that they, they, watch, the, if they watch the cricket, they get entertained from me and I'd like to think that every time I go out in the field, whether you like me or not, I'd like to think that it's more exciting when I'm playing than when I'm not. Shane Warne's impact has been epic, one of the greatest wicket takers the game would ever produce, rewriting the slow bowling records, capturing the imagination of cricket lovers around the world. Almost single-handedly, this extraordinary character renewed the leg-spinning craft as a frontline attacking weapon. His prolific wicket-taking ways would compel critics to name him in their all-time World Eleven. The skill he brought to the field would inspire the game's most astute observers to recast their precepts of bowling excellence. And boy, Benno's out of his seat. Which kept me in the game, I can tell you. And uh, I get uh, great enjoyment of watching him every time he walks on the field. He is the greatest leg spin bowler there's ever been. Don't ever be in any doubt about that. There are others who bowl in different styles, but Shane Warne is the greatest leg spin bowler there's ever been. My one wish is that I'd known as much about bowling as I do now from watching him as I did when I played, because I'd have bowled more like Warren than I bowled like Benno. Got him! That's well bowled, Shane Warren. What a wicket that is. He's really teed him up. I tried to understand how good Clary Grimmett must have been, and I saw how good Richie was, and then you see Shane and you just marvel at a man who uh, has got so much control of spin and shape and flight and commands such respect that he can have men around the bat all the time. And I, I just, I look at him in awe. Oh, oh he's got him, yes, he's trying to pad that one away and it's spun. From the moment he sort of came on the scene um, and gave cricket a real buzz about it and got young kids out there wanting to play cricket and people back watching the game. I think to see someone turn the ball so aggressively and, and such a big way, it, it really was something that a lot of people had never seen before and they wanted to come to the cricket to watch it and as players it, we're very fortunate that we had him on our side. Oh, and he's gone right through him. His approach to bowling is more like a fast bowler. In other words, you know, I'm going to get on top of you before you get on top of me. And, and I'm sure that's why he's had so, well, that and his skill um, and, his, and his great cricket brain, that's another part of the, uh, the package that's made Shane Warne so good. That is brilliant, bad leg and all. I just love it. I, I just absolutely love leg spin bowling and I could talk about it for hours and a ball in my hand, spinning the ball and just mucking around in the nets and trying different grips and bowling with a high arm, a round arm. Um, on the pool table doing different things with balls, you know, I, I just love it and um, I think that's the passion, I think the, the real desire and those sorts of things, I think they, deep down I've got a big passion for leg spin bowling and I really do, I just love it. The genesis of this tale is almost universal in theme. 
a suburban yard, a cast of cricketing heroes as role models, and the white-hot rivalry of two close brothers. When we used to play driveway cricket, it would bat right-handed, left-handed, bowl fast, off-spin, leg-spin, do everything. And uh, a couple of the guys where we played junior cricket, a couple of senior guys, uh, saw him actually landing leg-spin on the pitch, and uh, that was enough for them to try to get in his ear and try and convince him to keep bowling it, because that was the hardest thing to do, just actually land him on the pitch. Yeah, Jace and I used to pick... Um our World Eleven teams, you pick anyone in the world at that stage who was playing and you had to bat like them, you had to mimic them, whether it was um, you know, Ian Chappell with the collar up and chewing the gum or um, you know, it was Merv Hughes coming in like this or Alan Border batting and just little props and pull shots, um, Ian Botham, um, Larry Gomes batting with a group, different group, uh, Viv Richards with a swagger and the chewing gum. All these guys, and we had to bowl like them, whether it was you know, Viv Richards bowling a few part-time off-spinners or if it was a left-handed batsman like Alan Border, we had to bat like that. And we used to do that as kids, and um, uh, Jace and I had some pretty full-on... I remember he tried to shoot me with a spear gun one day, and, and we had a pretty tough a few times. We broke the eye, as all the kids do in Australia. We broke the odd window and things like that. And uh, Look, it was great times. You know, we had a tape tennis ball if it was a swing bowler. Um, you know, we used to wet the wicket and throw them off the bricks if it was a fast bowl. We did all different types of things and, um, yeah, look, it was just good fun. It's, it's something, I suppose, when oh, I've got a good relationship with my brother and, you know, growing up, I think he helped my competitive nature, being in the backyard. Like, you know, we could all, in the backyard, just have a bit of fun in the backyard, but we got pretty competitive in the backyard and I think that's a lot of the reason why my competitive spirit is so strong at international level. As kids, if I was beating him at something, we wouldn't stop until he had got his nose in front and uh, he'd try dirty tricks and everything to win. If he was winning and uh, I was coming back to try and get my nose in front, there'd always be a reason to stop just before I hit the lead. So he's, he's been always been very, very competitive in everything. The brothers soon outgrew their driveway games and headed for the larger fields of the East Sandringham Boys Club. It offered football in winter, cricket in summer, and proper tuition for promising young players. There, Jason and Shane would eventually play alongside their dad, Keith, in the club's lower grades. I really remember him as a very keen junior cricketer. You know, he absolutely loved cricket, obviously loved footy as well. But certainly in his cricket time, which we sort of had more to do with, you know, I can remember him talking about cricket all the time and the test matches that were on at the time. So I think he was just a mad keen sports lover as a boy who, uh, you know, loved every part of cricket and footy. Uh, my recollections are that beginning his uh, stay at East Sandy number 12s, he probably was a better batsman than a bowler. Uh, he made some big scores for a a young fella, you know, 30, 40, 50, which is a very good effort. Uh, but I also believe that, um, you know, any kid that's 10 or 11 that can bowl leg spin and hit the pitch and get a certain amount of turn is a very good performance. So, uh, and that he was definitely doing. Cricket may have been Shane's summer love, but in footy mad Melbourne, winter presented a much more powerful magnet and that's where his boyhood passions lay. The dream, I suppose, as a kid with my brother Jason growing up was um, to be an AFL footballer, or at that stage, VFL footballer. I always wanted to play footy. That was what I wanted to do. I, I, cricket, in the summer when it's 35 degrees and you stand at cricket field for six hours as a 13, 14, 15-year-old kid, to me, was pretty boring. And he played under-19s in 1988 and uh, quite successfully. He was full forward most of the time. I think he kicked something like 20-odd goals. Um, uh, we, we didn't get him much into the midfield because he was a little bit heavier probably than he should have been in those days. But he had terrific hands and he was a beautiful kick, uh, lovely balance and as we see by the way he bowls now he's got that lovely posture and that was the way he'd handle the ball and kick it extremely well. Shane Warne's professional sporting career began when the reserve grader signed a contract to play for St Kilda for the handsome sum of $100 a game. He kicked seven in the under-19s, uh, had something like 12 marks and 19 kicks that day in the under-19s. He was promoted to the reserves, 
He will say, I think, that he was a bit crook and he was going to withdraw from the under-19 side, but when he got the call up to the reserves, he thought, well, I'm not going to withdraw from this opportunity. Gary Colling was the coach of the reserves, who's a good friend of Shane's. And Shane will say that Gary really cost him his senior career because during that game he was playing in the forward pocket, I think, or full forward. And one incident, I think David Kernahan, who was the brother of Stephen, had three or four bounces down the ground and Shane wasn't chasing him too hard. And he was subsequently dragged and I don't think he got back on the ground. I remember driving home from training, had the music blaring and I thought, how good is this? Coming home and telling all my mates that, you know... I trained with the seniors tonight with Danny Frawley and Tony Lockett and all these sort of guys. And, uh, it, was just, it was just a great time and uh, I, I didn't really, I, I, was, I played full forward but I was never really tall enough to play that key position like that. Um, then they tried to move me out into a half forward flank but I wasn't fast enough so I really had to grow a little bit or get a bit quicker and I was neither so I suppose that was one of the reasons my football career, see you later. Uh, St Kilda uh, Football Club tipped the balance there because he was on the, uh, on the senior list at one stage and next minute he was dropped from the senior list. And I think it came as a bit of a shock to him. I think he thought he had a football career ahead of him. And um, he took that opportunity uh, to go over to England with a mate of his, Rick Goff, and he went over to play club cricket at Bristol. And, um, uh, yeah, well, cricket was his, his love from there on in because he had to forget about his football career. With his football options spent, Shane rediscovered his summer love, moving from St Kilda Football Club to St Kilda Cricket Club, where he would debut in the fourths. He was certainly carrying a little bit of weight. Uh, he had the peroxide hair then, uh, and he, uh, he certainly could bat. And uh, his leg spinners were, he spun the ball a long way, but his control was nothing like it is now, obviously. But uh, he, uh, he had talent, and uh, we, uh, we started him off in the fourths, and uh, he's gone on from there. Darren, tell me about your first recollections of seeing Warney play cricket. Um, it was probably of a, a rather plump young blonde leg spinner down at St Kilda and rolling into the Junction Oval in his Cortina, blaring. The, the music has always been blaring out of his cars, no matter what. It's from, gone from the Cortina through to the BMW, through to the Mercedes four-wheel drive, to the Ferrari. Music has always been coming out of his car, really amped up. So that was my first memory of him. and then. I toured the West Indies with Shane in the uh, Australian under-19 side. I'd heard that there was a boy in the West Indies with an underage side um, that I, I might like and I'd just sort of come to coaching. I hadn't coached really before, not specialising in spin. And this lad turned up and uh, I shook his hand and when I shook his hand uh, there was a friendship, there was a strength and there was a warmth there. I think that has typified our relationship ever since and he bowled me he said, what would you like me to do? And I said, would you like to bowl me a leg break, mate? You know, so he picked up the ball, minimum fuss, bowled a leg break. That I've never seen one that good in my life. And he's probably bowled a thousand or more of them since like that. And I just knew that he was special. The first time I saw him was um, on a Zimbabwean tour, um, a young Australia tour, and I could just see the ball fizzing out of his hands, and I knew that this guy was going to be special. And from that moment on, he's bowled some phenomenal spells where you t almost take it for granted that uh, he's landing him on the same bit of turf just about every delivery and turning them massive amounts and, and not bowling any loose deliveries. Um, it really is amazing. I think when we look back on it we'll probably appreciate it more than we do now. Myself and Stephen Waugh went away as sort of the senior guys, if that's the right way of putting it, on a tour of Zimbabwe, uh, a younger Australian side tour of Zimbabwe in 91. That's where we saw Shane Warren and the, and the deliveries he could bowl. He got two batsmen out that I can think of on the tour uh, Dave Houghton and uh, Andy Pycroft were the two guys, two of their senior players, both very good players in their own right. He got them out trying to cut flippers because they thought it was short and wide and the ball sort of zoomed in from outside off and beat them for pace, beat them for swing um, and just beat them all ends up and hit off stump this, this delivery. And, and we all sort of stood back and thought, how's he bowled that? Because we'd, we'd heard of this delivery but never seen any, anyone able to bowl it like that. He'd been over... Uh, to the Cricket Academy in Adelaide and um, he'd come back and he'd been selected for Victoria and I think uh, I first met him on the Wednesday night before his first game and um, he'll try and tell you that he'll, he'll shy and uh, lack confidence but uh, that's certainly not the way I remember him. He, he came in and I guess an 18, 19 year old I suppose and uh, he's just full of confidence and, and just seemed to, to get on well with everyone. After just seven first class matches for Victoria the leg spinner was a surprise inclusion in the test squad to meet the touring Indians in the summer of 91-92.
I didn't know what it was all about. I didn't even know if I was good enough to play at that level, let, let alone play seven games and then suddenly be playing for Australia. So it was all pretty pretty daunting. I didn't know where to sit in the dressing room. You know, I was sitting there with my bag and looking around, and there's Bruce Reed, Jeff Marsh, Alan Border, Dean Jones, Merv Hughes. Where do I sit? You know, I was just hung on to Merv and hang around him like a bad smell because I knew Merv from Victoria. So, yeah, look, it was pretty... It was pretty hard, actually, the first couple of games. And, you know, in the early late 80s, early 90s, it was a bit of the old school stuff. You sort of just sit there and don't say anything until you're spoken to and, you know, you get me a drink and all these sort of things and you had to earn your stripes. He actually came out to bat before bowling. I was wondering how the crowd was going to react to this guy. He's not even coming out. He's there as a bowler. Here he's coming out to bat. But the crowd were fantastic. Gave me a huge reception. And I think that's when I really, I, I really understood the, uh, the group that he was, he'd now joined, because uh, the scoreboard had a, uh, a sign up there and it was congratulations to Shane, you are the 350th te test cricketer for Australia. And I suddenly realised just how small a group that was. Considering cricket, I didn't have a great knowledge of how many cricketers had been over the, over the past hundred years or whatever, but uh, at a guess I would have said a thousand odd. And to find out he was the 350th, all of a sudden I realised, gee, what an honour this is. And he's got that off the meat of the bat. That's a good shot. Right over the top and uh, into the bleachers. The first time I saw him uh, really was in the test match against India at the SCG. And I thought, you know, I thought, despite the fact that he didn't do that well, I thought to myself, there's something here. He's a good player. What a glorious late cut. Waited for that. And it should go all the way. Jones is coming down hard on it. I got smashed all over the park. Sachin Tendulkar, I think, not sure if it was his first Test 100 or not. He'd just started. Ravi got 206. I dropped him, caught and bowled at 66 because I couldn't really touch my knees over my round tummy. And um, I couldn't bend over. Dropped him 66. He made 206. As I said, Sachin got a great 100. And I think every single part of the Sydney cricket ground I got hit for four or six. <laughs> it's in the air, Jones under it, that's the end of the innings, Shane Warne gets his first test wicket after prolonged trial and effort. When he finally got Ravi Shastri out, after he dropped him on an absolute sitter of a court and bowl, uh, I think Shane could have had one for six in his first test match with Ravi Shastri back in the pavilion, um, but he ended up getting Ravi Shastri out for 206 and Warney got a one for 150 or something like that. Look, I thought, what am I doing here, basically? Um, okay, I've played one test now. But can I go now? Do I have to play another one? Um, I played in Adelaide, and I got smashed again then. Um, I got dropped for the third test match in Perth. Well, I think Mike Whitney got seven for 27, and I got dropped there, and we beat India 4-0. So I got to the end of the series, I thought, wow, well, that was... It was unreal. I mean, I got smashed and all that, but it was great. And as I said, I, that's exactly what I knew what I wanted to do then. That's what I wanted. I wanted to play cricket for Australia. And I wanted to give myself every possible chance that I could. He got a big rap from um, Bill O'Reilly. Uh, the, the fact that even though he's getting belted around, he didn't experiment too much. He just kept bowling leggies and just kept bowling leggies. He was there doing a job that he thought he had to do. And uh, yeah, it was certainly a baptism of fire, wasn't it? Continuing to show faith in the young leg spinner, the Australian Cricket Board selected Warne for the 1992 tour of Sri Lanka. In the first test, with Australia defending a slender lead and Sri Lanka seemingly poised for an emphatic victory, Alan Border tossed the ball to his young leggy. I was broadcasting at Lords at the time, and the Lords public address system was giving the scores in that Sri Lankan match and everyone was roaring with pleasure and laughter as each score came through showing the Australians were getting stuffed out of sight. And all of a sudden, the announcer said, I'm afraid I have to tell you that Warren has taken three for none and Australia have won. And gloom and doom descended on the ground. Sri Lanka, to me, was probably my favourite test match of all time. 1992, the first test in Sri Lanka in Colombo, it, um, it was just such a wonderful game. Uh, we were miles behind. Sri Lanka ended up needing 186 for victory, and they were two for 120. Uh, I'd bowled, I think, at that stage, 15 overs in the first innings and got none for 130 or something like that. I got smashed in the first innings after being 
smashed in a, uh, Australia through the, for, off the Indians. Did all this hard work and thought, righty, I, just because I've done this hard work, I've worked my butt off, I've been bowling, I'm going really well. Got smashed in the first innings. And I remember sitting in the, cha in the change rooms watching us bat in the second innings and Alan Border said, you know, just keep persevering, mate. It's amazing how things can turn around for you. Just keep working. You're doing the right things. You're working hard. It'll happen. <sighs> yeah, sure. Uh, I went out to dinner with Greg Matthews the night before the last day and he said, mate, they wouldn't have picked you if you, couldn't, if you weren't good enough get out there and give him a rip and he was fantastic and uh, we get to last day 186 Sri Lanka need to win two for 120 I'd bowled one over none for 11 that day um, and I just felt like I didn't belong we got to I think they need about s or 25 to win something like that now on border signaled to me warm up next over I'm thinking <laughs> it's gonna be all over and an over we're gonna lose and um, I came on, I bowled a maiden. Greg Matthews got a wicket the next over. And then I come on and got uh, three for none in a couple of overs. And um, I just felt like, and we won, we ended up winning by, I think, 13 or 16 runs. And it was just an amazing test match. And for me personally, it, was, it just felt like, I mean, I got three bunnies out at the end, but it just felt like I actually contributed something to the victory. Fittingly, the foundation of the Shane Warne legend would be laid on his home ground, the MCG. Playing against the powerful West Indies, he produced an astonishing final day performance, capturing the prized scalp of Richie Richardson and match-winning figures of 7 for 52. He's like doing, oh, and he's bowled him. That has just beaten the outside edge. It also kept a little bit low, but Richie Richardson was looking very comfortable, and all of a sudden, Shane Warner struck. What a wicket this is for Australia. That was a big wicket, because Richie Richardson was a quality player, and when you sort of uh, put one over a batsman like that, it, it gives you enormous confidence, and gives the whole side a lift that someone gets out to a delivery like that, and the rest of the guys are watching, and they're not sure what's going to happen, and straight away we sort of get the, the tempo going in our favour rather than it going against us. Well, Richie Richardson was such a stroke maker, he liked to play all his shots and he sort of had his weight on the back foot and he used to hit off the back foot but just smash the ball. And I, I think the balls leading up to that, I played a couple of big shots to cover and hit them straight to the fielders. And I said, right, it's time to bowl a flipper. And it was just one of those things that just happened. It was, uh, came out of the hand perfectly, I didn't try and bowl it too quick. Uh, just came out perfectly, kept a little low on the ground as well and he went back and hit his stumps and it was bold. It was just a, mate, I mean, it was just, it was just a wonderful feeling to know that you've tried something that worked and um, no, that's something I'll never forget, that Richie Richardson delivery for sure. Yes, beat him. Beautiful piece of work by Healy. That's fine bowling by young Shane Warne. Suddenly Shane Warne got that flipper through Richie Richardson and that just changed the whole game. And I think it probably convinced Shane Warne, you know, seven wickets uh, against, you know, what was the best team around at the time. Uh, that that uh, probably convinced Shane Warne that he was uh, he was a Test match player. And straight to slip. That's the end of him. Well bowled, Shane Warne. Oh, it was a stunning result, but I've always said a spin bowler is only good as the fast bowler at the other end, and I was bowling it. No, he's, he's seven for in that game was fantastic, and um, that's when I suppose he, he let a few of these tricks out of the bag, and, and the flipper uh, that got uh, Richie Richardson was absolutely superb, and everyone sort of, where'd that come from? Because he hadn't really been practising it um, all that often, and when he did it, it was well wide of the mark, and from that, he just seemed to, to grow in confidence, and he's never looked back. That could be the end of the test match. Seven wickets for Shane Warne. Big Merv's got great hands. He won't miss it. And there it is. A great victory for Australia and a tremendous day's work for Shane Warne. His best bowling ever in first-class cricket. And what a time to do it. And what a place to do it in front of his own crowd here at the MCG. That was uh, probably the turning point in my career where I got to last day. We needed to bowl the West Indies out for victory. Uh, I got 7.52. We knocked them over and as... Uh, it was just a wonderful feeling to walk off in your home crowd at the MCG uh, with 7.52 next year. We've just beaten the West Indies and you felt like, hey, I can play at this level if uh, I can bowl like that, I can play at this level. 
The 20th century was 93 years old when Shane Warne made his first tour to the country that gave cricket to the world. It was worth the wait. His first delivery in a test match on English soil would become known in cricket legend as the ball of the century. He's done it. He started off with the most beautiful delivery. Gary has absolutely no idea what has happened to it. He still doesn't know. The Gadding ball was special because uh, it rejuvenated test cricket, it revolutionised spin bowling, if you like. So it was special. When Alan Border gives you the signal warm up and you know you're going to bowl, you start to get a bit of sweaty palms and you think, please, you know, don't drop them short, uh, just land them somewhere in the right area. I remember standing at the top of my mark and shining the ball and trying to breathe and just relax. And I remember walking up to the wicket looking at Mike Gadding and just letting the ball go. And I think for anyone that's done anything that just, they felt like it all happened in slow motion and it didn't take any effort. It just come out of the hand, it, like it just felt perfect out of the hand. And I remember just watching it drift in and Mike Gatting play and hit the top of off stump. And when we all sort of jumped around, I don't think I realised, I just thought it was a leg break. I didn't really realise until I think we went to lunch or tea, I can't exactly remember. I think it was the BBC in England was showing the wickets of who each one that fell and we all sort of looked up and I went, Jesus, that spun a bit that. And then they showed it over and over again and I sort of looked at it and thought, that wasn't bad, that, that was pretty good. And the rest of that day went pretty well. I, I knocked over Robin Smith the next over, probably the same ball except he nicked it and Mark Taylor took a good low down catch. And, um, with that ball, the Mike Gatting ball I think changed my life, let alone my confidence in, um, in cricket. I think it just changed my life, suddenly everybody the end of that match wanted to know what Shane Warne was all about, what he actually did, how he spent his time, who it was with. Um, yeah, just everything about me, everybody wanted to know and uh, I think that ball really did change my life. You know, we were sitting there at uh, Manchester and Old Trafford and uh, when he bowled that ball, it was quite uh, amazing actually, it was quite eerie. There was deadly silence for just a split second and then all of a sudden the crowd erupted. The silence was wondering what the heck had happened and then they erupted when they suddenly realised, my God, Gatting's been bowled with a ball that was on the other side of the pitch one moment ago. So yeah, it was an incredible ball. Incredible moment to be there. The ball that bowled Gatting was uh, a great delivery, there's no doubt about that. It uh, didn't drift as far or spin back as far as it's been said because we've been able to measure it since but it was the most perfect delivery in that it got on with Gatting or any other batsman's blind spot. And as he played at it and was trying to cover everything, it just sneaked past the outside of his right thigh and clipped the top of the off bail. A few balls later, Warren bowled an equally good delivery to get Robin Smith, a better ball in my view, because it found the edge and Mark Taylor took a very good catch at slip. So those two deliveries, I always say, they're two of the greatest I've ever seen, and they turned the Test Series. Everyone else, well, most people say, oh, the Gatting ball was the one that turned it. But that Robin Smith one put doubts in everyone's mind as well. We all knew he could bowl it, but first ball of England, um, that just rocked them, uh, and they were gone from that moment on. The thing that people don't realise is that Mike Gatting's seen as the best player of spin in the English game, so it would have been interesting to be a fly on the wall in the English rooms just to, to see or to hear the panic that went on there because um, Gatting just had no idea and if he had no idea um, that must have impacted on the, the English player, there's no doubt about that. I remember uh, talking to Michael Atherton about it and Michael Atherton said that when he first played Test Match Cricket uh, and saw Shane Warne, uh, and all these deliveries, he didn't even know what some of them were. He, he knew what a leg spinner was, but he didn't, didn't have a great idea about flippers, or wrongens, or zooters, or whatever other word Warney comes up with them. So uh, when batsmen don't know what's coming at them to start with, straight away he's got a huge advantage. Then the batsman will go away and look at some videotape, work out how he can play it better. But all of a sudden, uh, Warney's in their mind, he's in the back of their mind, and he's working away uh, at their psyche. So next time he faces them, OK, they might be a little bit better prepared, but they know that what's going to come out of his hand is good quality stuff. And if they don't play anywhere near their best, he'll get them. 
Oh, he's done him. The 1970s and 80s was an era ruled by pace bowlers. It was a time when captains and selectors were suspicious of the often inaccurate and expensive ways of the leg spinner. But then came Shane Warne, blessed with phenomenal accuracy and prodigious spinning ability. He would elevate the art to a new high. Oh, beautifully bowled. We've often talked about the fact that he's the best leg spin bowler that there's ever been. A man that, that makes it curve. Uh, very few kids get the ball to curve. Very few leg spinners get it to curve. He does it naturally, and, and that's one of his magnificent uh, gifts. Um, others uh, try to make it drift by doing funny things with their hands. Shane does it with spin. He's just had so much going for him that, that at times, um, I think he's, he's gone a little bit bored, um, but then he's become revitalised, and every time he gets revitalised, it's no secret that the Australian team get revitalised too. If you look at Shane Warne's hands, he's got thick fingers, which is a prerequisite, I think, or the long fingers for leg spinning. And he's really strong. He's a strong person, strong wrists, strong fingers. And uh, he's always spun the ball a long way. When he first started, he never had the control that he's got now. But uh, that's something that, that always stood out from a young age, how much he could spin the ball. I think there's things that Shane Warne can do that other leg spinners can't. Whether that's his arm, whether it's his fingers, whether it's his body, something is built um, freakishly that's given him greater ability than others and I think that's what he's got. I think he's got physical ability uh, more than other spinners right from the word go. His accuracy is uh, combined with the spin is what's made him so special. Batsmen never get away from him. And it's, it's, it's awesome. I mean, I remember when I used to bat against Dennis Lilly, for example, and you used to want to get a one to get away from them. I can tell you that if you don't get away from someone like Warren, he'll get you too. And for once uh, in a long time, a spin bowler is as dangerous, if you like, as a pace bowler. So he has the ability to keep you on strike at the same time as uh, working you over. Got him! Well, that's magnificently bowled. Taylor had a word with him. He's a very aggressive player, and I say that in the nicest possible way. He's, to me, um, a slow bowler uh, with a fast bowler's mentality. Uh, and as I mentioned, he has the ability to intimidate batsmen by his deliveries, and also by the way he's able to get into their psyche uh, and worry them with his deliveries. He doesn't have the, 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 the fast bowler's advantage of being able to bowl 140 kilometres an hour and bowl short, which is a worry when you're a batsman. He doesn't have that, but he's still able to intimidate batsmen just by his range of deliveries and the way that he gets under their skin. Got it, yes, well taken, that's out. Trying to work the ball on the onside, that's good bowling by Shane Warne. Well, it is a mysterious art, and I think what you're trying to do as a leg spinner, uh, we, I suppose we've got a lot of bag of tricks, I suppose, we've got a few things up our sleeve, and we're always trying to s pretend that there's something more there as well. Sometimes, depending on the conditions you're playing on big spinning wickets, um, your best weapon is natural variation in the pitch and a lot of the players you might get a bowl big leg break and it goes straight and you get a bloke out LBW and everyone say what was that straight one or the slider or flipper or whatever to say yeah 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 I got him with the slider that time it was just a leg break that didn't turn and I think if the batsman doesn't know what you're trying to do as I said with natural variation if you bowl a leg break and it goes straight hits him on the pad and it's meant to spin well he's got no chance when you're not sure what you're actually doing well bowled, flipper again. He used to always say, if a batsman hits me for six, look out, I'll get him. And that was his attitude, and it was very true. The number of times uh, someone would run down the wicket at him and go bang and plant him out of the ground. And you could almost see Warnie sort of rubbing his hands, if to say, OK, you've got one away, but my record would suggest that I'm going to get you very shortly. And he does. Cut shot, Gilchrist appeals the same. Doesn't get 50, Warn gets him. I remember... Keith Arthurton was one from, from the West Indies. Keith was, being a left-hander, had the advantage of the ball spinning back into him. And he used to be able to hit with the spin and hit him a long way. But the number of times he hit Warney for a six and then was out within an over or two of hitting the six was, um, was just, just remarkable, really, the amount of times he'd get him. Oh! He's got that one through. Shane's not afraid to be scored from. Some captains are scared to allow their bowlers to be hit. And once we get that message across, that not everyone can bowl like Warren, that is, miserly, leg spinners will get scored from in the name of taking wickets. 
that's what he's given us. He's, he's given us uh, the, the opportunity, if you like, to when a spin bowler's on, to watch the over and go out while the fast bowler's on and make a cup of tea instead of the other way around. When you've got the ball in your hand, depending on the match situation, there might be um, there on top and you really have to fight back and you have to take a couple of wickets, so you've got to try and be aggressive and sometimes create something that's not there. Let the batsman think that there's um, uh, it's turning square and it might be hitting the middle of his bat and he sort of looks at you and goes, what are you on about when you give him that? Oh, this sort of stuff. That, that's just all theatrics, I suppose, and trying to create something, an illusion to the batsman. There's it's, it's a lot happening when there's actually nothing happening. And I think that um, those sort of things that you try and do is you're trying to always put yourself, letting the batsman not know exactly what you're thinking, not saying, what, what's he up to? What's he up to? Is there, what's he going to do next? And they're trying to outthink you. And I think that's the wonderful thing about spin bowling. Fast bowling, I love watching Brett Lee or those sort of guys come in and try and knock the batsman's head off and they start hooking. I think that's a great part of cricket. I think it's exciting. But as a spinner, you really have to use your brain. I'm not saying the quicks are dumb or anything, but what I'm saying is the spinners, we actually think. And as spinners, we have to outthink the batsmen. So you have to try and get inside their mind and try and be one step ahead of them all the time. And you've got to have a plan. And you've got to try and set them up for something. You might be working them across the crease. Um, you might be working back the other way. You might be trying to do lots of different things. But the most important thing what you're trying to do is to make sure that you outthink them. And when you actually have a plan and it comes off, it's very satisfying. You wouldn't believe it. He's done in between his legs. Well, whatever it is they talked about, you can bet your life in future it'll be, why don't you give him the one that'll bowl in between his legs? He always bowls as if he's on top. Even if he's not on top, a batsman, not many around the world have ever taken to him. But if they have, he always seems to have that aura or the edge that, you know, I'm on top. I don't care what you're doing, I'm on top. And that's what makes him the champion player that he is. And uh, from behind the stumps, you know, watching that unfold sometimes I um, mean, Sheffield Shield Pura Cup matches has been um, something that I'll, I'll always remember. Any spinner who had Shane Warne's mind would be 90% of the way, and 90% of him is mental. But he's better than every other one for physical too, so it brings it back for him. I reckon 60% mental, 40% skill, because he's got outstanding skill levels as well. Um, but it, it's a, such a helpless skill, bowling leg spin. If any, anyone's never tried it, go and try it. Try and bowl over 20 metres and try and bamboozle batsmen of the highest calibre, like Shane Warne does. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, he's got to have some mind games. He's, got, he's had a support of media that have written his mind games in the press too, so that the opponents see that. Um, but certainly, uh, he's got everything. He's got the fast bowler's physical mentality to go with magnificent finesse and skill. As if his enormous talent wasn't enough, he came equipped with another, more indefinable quality. It was the spark of the showman, a certain charisma and aura. It earned him the nickname Hollywood. Got him! I think he just loves being the showman, being the guy, the centre stage performer. Um, and that's not in an arrogant, sort of selfish way, just, but he just goes out there and he thinks he wants to be the one to do the business, I suppose, and, and be, as I say, the centre of attention. And even in the change rooms, he's, he's as I say, a great team man, but it's always worn he's in the middle of everything. Ah! That's got to be out. Yes, that's Clark. Beautifully bowled. 100 test wickets for Shane Warne. I like to consider myself an entertainer. I think in this day and age, when you're paying pretty big bucks to come and watch any sort of sport, whether it's AFL football or cricket, uh, I like to think that people pay their money, you've got to put on a show. And that means entertaining cricket. Not little medium paces bowling with one slip and ring fields and very boring stuff. It's got to be entertaining, attacking cricket. Hey! Gone. That's our joy! When Bradman started to play in test cricket, and the wicket would fall, and the players would put their hands in their pockets, and Billy Bull might light a cigarette behind the umpire so no one could see, and they'd have a bit of a chat, the next batsman would come in. Then when our era came along, we'd be much more de demonstrative, but nowhere near as much as the modern day player can be uh, because of television and uh, because of uh, the way life is. It is quite possible to be an entertainer. Warren is uh, 
certainly not ahead of his time there, there were plenty of others around. Miller was a wonderful entertainer, but in a quieter way. But it just goes with, with life and cricket nowadays to be an entertainer, and Warren certainly is that. Larry can character, those sort of things I suppose would be used for, to describe me. I see myself as a cricketer who uh, gives his best every time and I like, to, I, I like to be exciting. I like to go out there and try and do something that nobody's done before. I like to try and turn a game when it really needs to be turned. Um, I like to have the ball in my hand. I don't know what you call that, I, I'm not sure. but. Uh, Sometimes the way I go about it, uh, a lot of people would say I like this to be the centre of attention. I'd love a l lot less attention, to be perfectly honest. But when it really counts, I like to have the ball in my hand. So if that means I like to be the centre of attention, the game's there in the balance, I want the ball in my hand to change a game. If that means I like to be the centre of attention, then so be it. I'd love to be no attention and just do my thing off the field, but unfortunately my life will never be like that. Warm continuing. And hit the bat. Yes, he's got him. That's Nothing better describes the absolute dominance of ball over bat than the term hat trick. At the MCG in December 1994, England again fell under the spell of Shane Warne. If there was ever an example of the master at his work, it was embodied in three unforgettable deliveries. Oh, and that's out. Caught behind. Yes, he's got him. Fast ball. Beautifully bowled by Warne. Got just pushing forward. A faint little touch there. Two wickets in two balls. Well bowled. I was part of the, the hat trick, the second dismissal, Darren Goff. Oh, and then it was a big team thing. What are you going to bowl uh, for the third one when Devin Malcolm was on the way in? And he picked the right thing. He, he chose very well. Everyone was saying different things. Big leg spinner, you know, flipper. Uh, but he chose a, a top spinner which was going to bounce so that if Devin didn't quite um, read it, then the bounce might cause some trouble, might get the bat or the gloves, which ended up happening. So uh, he, he's a very independent man. But I, I think that hat trick in Melbourne stands out, uh, the, you know, the fondest memory. Uh, it was a very pumped moment for the Australian cricket team. To take a hat trick in Melbourne against England was, was something special. Um, you know, if you're going to bowl to anyone, Devin Malcolm's not a bad bloke to bowl to either for your hat trick. Um, it was Booney's, David Boone's birthday. And I remember sitting at the top of the mark, Devin Malcolm looking like the Michelin man with that much padding on him all over the place. He's taking guard. There's a lot of suggestions about should you bowl a flipper, leg break, um, straight one, uh, wrong one. You know, all the different deliveries were thrown up. And I remember asking Damien Fleming, he got a hat-trick on debut. I said, what, it, what went through your mind, mate? And he said, I just closed my eyes and pictured what I wanted to bowl. I said, OK. All right, so I went back to the top of mark and I said, I so probably should bowl a leggy or a flipper. He's either going to nick it or try and get him bowled or LB. And I sort of was spinning the ball for a while and he was taking centre looking at the field and I suppose I just exaggerated a little bit and waited for a bit longer and I thought I think I should bowl a leggy but with overspin on it. So more of a top spinner but with just a little bit of leg spin that hopefully he'll go forward and, and get a nick. Five men plus the keeper around the batsman. There we go. Fleming took the last one. Merv Hughes before him. So I came in to bowl, bowled the delivery, it was just nice, pitch nice, Malcolm went forward to block it, a bounce with the overspin, hit his glove and David Boone took an absolute scream, I caught it in two fingers on his birthday and, um, and when I see it I just remember listening to Tony Gregg, yes well he's got him, what a moment, he's going off and we were celebrating and um, oh look it was just a special time, it was just, it was, it was great. He's bowled him around the legs once again. And that's uh, Shane Warne's best bowling in Test cricket. His ability to baffle batsmen right around the world was only one part of the picture. At the same time, he was amassing a remarkable strike rate, tearing up the records and passing milestones at bewildering pace. I also remember his 300th Test wicket, uh, Jacques Callas, the SCG. He bowled him a wrong and from around the wicket, and that was just outstanding delivery because he bowled over the wicket, he was all over them. And I remember talking with Stephen Warwick, I think Stephen Warwick was at second step, and we said when Warnie was bowling, 
this guy is all over them. He was turning them and every ball he was bowling was coming out right. And he went round the wicket. And we all thought, why is he going round the wicket? He's, he's worrying them. First ball, he bowls a wrong and pitches on about middle stump, spins from off to leg, which is what the wrong one is supposed to do, and hits middle leg. And out he goes, three hundred test wickets. He was bowling that well on that day, he could have bowled from just about anywhere and picked up wickets. Oh! Got it! Well bowled! 300 test wickets for Shane Warne. That was a beautiful delivery to get it. That was Queen bowled for 45. It's basically the only time I've ever set myself a goal in that summer. We had New Zealand, South Africa and Australia and I said, Rightio, by the end of this summer I want 300 test wickets. It's the first time I've ever set a personal milestone. I don't know why I did it, I just, I just wanted to do it. And um, I thought if I do that, the team's going to win and uh, it'd be nice to take your 300th wicket in Australia. I was around the wicket of Jacques Callas, who's a, a you know, quality player, one of the best all-rounders in the world. I was bowling around the wicket and he was sweeping pretty well, so I thought I'd bowl a top spinner actually. No legs or anything, just a straight out, straight break that would dip on him a little bit. And uh, he played forward and small gap between bat and pad and it, it snuck through and hit the stumps from around the wicket. Um, and I remember just, it was just sheer satisfaction and uh, emotion coming out. I remember looking at the footage and I sort of get a cringe a little bit, get a bit embarrassed when I twirl my fingers around and stuff like that, but it was... Um, it was just pure emotion and, and, and satisfaction that, uh, look, I, I, this is what I wanted to do and um, I've achieved it. And that is a huge blow for Warren as he equals Dennis Lilly and the most wickets for Australia. Dennis Lilly was an idol as a kid, um, you know, the big fight running in. It was He was, uh, as a kid in the backyard, Jason and I used to love Dennis Lilly. Just his passion, you could just tell the way he played, he had passion. And, um, you know, just the, the, the wipe of the brow, just everything about Dennis Lilly was fantastic. Um, and to get to, oh, when I was getting close to breaking his record, it was, I, I think I tensed up and wanted to do it. And I think I spoke to a lot of people about records and things like that, and it's more relief than anything else. That might sound funny, but when you actually get there, it's, it's a bit of a relief. It's not... I don't play for personal milestones and things like that, but you do give yourself a bit of a pat on the back and the way things are these days, there's nothing that gets missed and you're always aware of, you know, if you overs you've bowled or wickets taken against the country, everybody sort of knows and you don't go out and play for them, but a major record like that, the most ever wickets for Australia is a pretty big achievement and it was just that I just tried too hard. I, had, I should have got it in one test. I should have got the last six or seven wickets I needed. We played on a big raging turner in New Zealand and it took me two or three games to get it. To break his record and for him to, you know, send me a message and say, look, I can't wait to have a beer with you, mate. It's, um, if there's anyone in the world I want to break my record, you're the guy I'd love to do it. I love watching you bowl. And um, that meant a hell of a lot to me. And, um, you know, we've had a beer and celebrated and talked about it. And um, it felt bad, really, to break, him, break his record. He's an idol and to have more wickets than him is irrelevant. He, he still will always be the man to me and um, just because I've got more wickets in him doesn't mean that he's not the man. Standing ovation from the people here at Eden Park and the champion leaves the field. Australia's highest ever test wicket taker. When you're currently playing you don't really realise what you've actually done. Yeah you say look breaking Dennis Lee's record um, one of Wisdom's five cricketers of the century. It's um, when you say it in an interview like this, it's sort of, um, you sort of think, that hasn't been too bad. But at, when you're playing, all you're doing is playing and trying to win. As, as a player, all I want to do is go out in the park, give 100% every single time I play, and um, hopefully end up with the right result, and that's a win. In his 100th test, Shane Warne was honoured with leading Australia into field. The Cape Town's a wonderful setting to play your 100th test match, and the way the test match went, you know, it was just a great game of cricket. And for me personally, to make a few runs, make 60 odd runs, and I bowled the most overs I think I've ever had in a test match. I think I bowled 98 overs, and I think I bowled 74 or 75 overs in the second innings with a, with a dodgy hamstring. I, I tore my hamstring the morning of the, um, the game. So, 
Yeah, look, I was uh, very, very satisfied. Satisfaction, I suppose, is a word of, of um, some of the things you've achieved. It's just a, a great moment in your life, and I suppose when you're sitting around with your mates looking back and you talk about a few things, that, you know, that, that, that's probably one of the things we'll talk about, I suppose, or I will anyway. from Shane Warne. His teammates have always known there's an enigma at the heart of the Warne story. As much as the consummate showman dominated the limelight, he was always more motivated by team success rather than personal glory. This was never more evident than when Australia contested the 1999 World Cup. He's a guy that lifts for those big occasions and that, that World Cup was uh, the prime example of that. Uh, things hadn't really gone well for the team in the first few rounds, uh, but then we got it together and got a bit of momentum going. And, but um, you know, in that semi-final, we desperately needed a, an early wicket, and we didn't get it immediately. I think they were none for 40, but we just needed a breakthrough, to, a spark to get us going. And, and Warney came on, and uh, and his first two or two three overs, he had three wickets, and just his reaction to those wickets was what probably lifted us. You thought, it's only something spectacular is going to get Australia back into this game. Suddenly there's Shane Warne, he's in the thick of it, he gets a wicket, and I'll, I'll never forget when he got a wicket and he was charging down and he was yelling, come on! You know? And you could just see that he was the one in that Australian side who believed that they could still win that match. And as far as I'm concerned, the wickets were very, very important for Australia. But I think it was the fact that Shane Warne believed so passionately that they could win the game. I think he dragged the whole team with him. To think of all that he had accomplished up to that point and to see that it still meant so much to him and, and it could uh, ignite that sort of fire in his belly, it was um, enough to drag everyone up with him and really lift for that, those efforts. Enjoyment comes from winning. I think uh, winning is a major part of enjoying what you do. The satisfaction you get of um, a plan as a bowler, having a plan to get a particular batsman out and seeing that come off, it doesn't always happen, but uh, sometimes it does happen. Uh, I think the camaraderie with the guys in the dressing rooms well, after you've won a test match and you sit around and tell each other how good you are and um, just that camaraderie and the, the, the you'd do anything for your mate, uh, whatever it means, you do that for them, you put yourself out for them, you do whatever it takes. And I think the enjoyment, you take the whole package and it's just a, a wonderful experience to play for Australia and it's um, thoroughly enjoyable. Oh, good shot, beautiful. No. Warren's value as a strike bowler made him an automatic selection for Australia. That ability perhaps disguised his talent as a lower order batsman. In 2001, at the Wacker ground against New Zealand, he had an elusive maiden test century in his sights. One of my main goals is to get 100 in a test match. That'll be, you know, the wickets and all those sorts of things are great and uh, I'll never take them for granted, but a hundred is something I want to do. I remember walking out, he was in the 90s, and I must say it's the most nervous I've been walking out the bat. And I thought, if I get out here, you know, Shane will never talk to me again. But uh, no, not quite, but uh, you know, I've been out with Steve in the 90s quite a bit and I've never been that nervous, you know, for wanting to be so close to a hundred and yeah, I'm out there at the last batsman, I only had to face a couple of balls, so it wasn't too bad. And then when Warney got so close, you know, I thought he's got, you know, he's got to get it. And I was thinking the shot he should be playing. And I, like, probably a good thing I didn't go down and tell him what, <laughs> what I thought he would have sent me on my way. Taking quick single. Well, a direct hit might have been interesting, but Shane won't survive and moves to 99. All I was thinking, Daniel Vittori was bowling. And I said, righty, I just pick the right one to hit or just work a single. Stephen Fleming, the captain of New Zealand, played it beautifully. He took a long time to set the field. He came in a bat pad on the offside, had a bit of a chat, and I was trying not to smile and laugh and come on, concentrate. Daniel bowled a beautiful delivery first one, tossed it up, looked at us and uh, block. Second ball, same, block. Third ball, block. So now I'm starting to get a little bit agitated and a bit, a few little words coming around. I'm starting to think, Righto, come on. So I walked away a little bit, took a deep breath, said, Rightio, just pick the right ball. And then I don't know what happened. I put the bat down and said, Rightio, this is going. I don't care where it is, it's going. 
He had two blokes out here, and I thought, righty, I just sort of chip it just before him, just hit it, just left of the mid wicket, just chip it out there and get a single. Okay, Dan Vittori bowls an absolute beautiful cherry again. I said, and then just the adrenaline, the blood rush. I swung when I looked at the footage. I swung, swung really hard, and um, I wasn't meant to do that. Straight down Richardson, straight at deep mid wicket, and I just thought, you idiot, what were you doing? Goes for it. There's a man out there who's getting under it. And he's got it. And Shane Warne tragically finishes on 99. The team were great. They came up and said, bad luck, mate. Tough lines. It was bad luck. And um, went back to my room at the hotel, the Hyatt, and um, sat there and looked, just stared at the ceiling most of the night and thought, why didn't you just do this? Why didn't you just turn that? Why didn't you just lap it over there for one? Why didn't you wait for another ball? And I think there hasn't been a day gone past when I haven't thought of a different shot I could have played to get a single. So hopefully one day I'll get there, but um, who knows? The dire spirit thought the Shane Warne has played brilliantly. He's caught going for the slog sweep in the deep. And his wonderful innings ends. Got him. Shane Warne's astounding career high has would be interspersed with a corresponding spate of deep lows. The key to his craft, his magical spinning finger, would require surgery. And he would badly dislocate his right shoulder, driving point of his bowling arm. Oh, hello, there's a, there's a problem out there and uh, Warne uh, has gone down on his shoulder and he looks as if he's in a spot of bother. This could be... Uh, oh, he's obviously popped it out. Yet with each setback, he would recover form and fitness to resume his career as the world's premier slow bowler. He's been put on his backside a couple of times, if you can put it that way, um, at the height of careers. Uh, you know, a career threatening injury is, is what no player wants. And uh, he's gone right back through that black tunnel of darkness, if you like, and had to claw his way back to the top again. The hardest thing was when he had the finger operation. He came back from that and he wasn't spinning it and he was worried and, and it was one day in the nets in Sydney bowling to Ian Healy that the key to the door was open. He, he bowled, finally bowled a magnificent leg break, it spun a long way. I said, mate, that is a leg break that everybody would die for. And he said, was it good, was it? And I said, mate, that was sensational. And he said, if it was so good, how come it didn't feel so good? We discovered that he had a different feel through this finger operation there was a different feel. So he had to work through all that and he worked through it and re-established himself with that new feel in his fingers. Look I went through some really tough times with that probably the most down I've been in my whole life about uh, am I ever going to be able to do something I love doing that's play cricket. Am I ever going to have that opportunity again? Has it been taken away from me from an injury? Um, so that was really really tough and the people close to me, my family, my brother, my wife and my close mates, you know, Darren Berries and Merv Hughes and these type of guys. They were the guys that knew what I was going through. It was really, really, really tough. That was really hard. I really admire Shane. I'm so proud of him, what he had to go through with the shoulder operation, with the finger operation, not knowing whether he was going to be able to come out and do what, you know, he used to do. Um, he just worked so hard and trained so hard and his physio, Lim Watson, and Debbie, who worked on his finger after he had the finger operation, they were just fantastic. You know, they were almost sort of psychologists as well because they just, you know, they used to talk to him and, you know, they, they helped him through the whole time and it was, it was a really hard time for him to go through the injuries and to know whether he was ever going to be able to bowl like he used to bowl and there was always the knockers that went along and said, oh, he'll never be as good as he was and you know, all that sort of stuff that comes out, but it's great to sort of sit back and smile now and see what he's doing and what he's achieved. You don't really realise how much you miss it until it's gone and it's taken away from you. And in that time of re rehabbing and watching the guys play cricket, and I mean, I remember some nights dressing up in my test gear with a ball, watching the test matches, wanting to come back. Um, you know, I was going through a lot of things to try and find that feeling of what it felt like to miss it and I was jumping around, I was probably pretty painful to be around. Uh, down the dumps, pretty gloomy. Um, 
But other times I've always tried to remain positive in everything I've done. Uh, that was probably the one time with my shoulder operation that I did get a bit down. Um, so I did, it really did, I suppose, make me appreciate how much I did love the game. Not so much me getting out there and playing, but just representing a country, being able to bowl leg breaks and do something you love doing. I really did miss that and that was when all my energies were uh, put towards doing whatever I have to do to get back on the field. During the long rehabilitation from shoulder surgery, there emerged a new Shane Warne. The pudgy profile was gone, replaced by a more defined shape and a superior level of fitness. Actually, when he started off his career, he was 15 kilos over on this junior or underage Australian 11 in Zimbabwe. And we were searching him out and said, look, if you lose 14 kilos and get serious about it, well, then you'll probably just walk into the Australian team. Well, he did that back in 91, 92. And he, re he held that fitness for a couple of years and then started to enjoy the trappings that come with success and has done most of his career with those few extra uh, kilos. Um, but this year, the start of the year, he decided to get really serious and uh, he's not getting any younger. So he really put his mind to it and lost a lot of, uh, a lot of weight and recaptured a lot of sharpness and agility and fitness, if you like. So even bowling a lot better, if it's possible, but more consistently, uh, uh, the old shame worn. Uh, it's been pretty hard, uh, cutting out pizzas and chips and all those sorts of things that I love, that it tastes good. Occasionally now, I've got to a stage now where it's just moderation, so I can have a little ham and pineapple pizza when I want. Um, gone off the beer, I've supplemented that for, uh, for wine, that's all going well. But look, I'm, I think at the moment I'm just enjoying what Shane Warne is all about. I think for a long time, or well, probably the last three or four years, I haven't really enjoyed being Shane Warne. I think it's been... I've been under the pump from lots of different areas and things haven't gone the way I would like and things have been portrayed to the public not the way I would like. So I think I, to come through the other side and come through all the, the bad things that have happened, come up to what I've got today, um, it feels quite nice to be Shane Warne again. I just can't believe how well he's done. Shane was just an amazing person to watch lose the weight and how he did it. He was just so determined and just how he went cold turkey on things like butter and, you know, chips and stuff like that. He just he just doesn't eat it now. When he always used to love eating, you know, a packet of chips or lots of butter on the toast, but now he just he just doesn't have those things and he's just his willpower is just amazing how he can just do things like that. Before the rejuvenated Leggy could enjoy the fruits of his newfound fitness, there came a bolt from the blue. He tested positive to a banned diuretic and was suspended from cricket for 12 months. To get the call from Asda, first of all, I thought it was a joke and uh, hung up a few times and they rang back and said, look, this is serious. And I said, well, I haven't done it. I, as far as I'm concerned, I haven't been taking anything that's performance enhanced, haven't been taking anything that I don't know you're not allowed to. And uh, in the end, one thing led to another. We came back and I uh, came to Australia, got the 12-month ban. And um, I was pretty disappointed for that because basically all I thought I was guilty of, and which was all the uh, evidence that presented at the case, basically all I was guilty of uh, was not checking a book and not realising that I should have checked before. We've had these courses where we sit and say, whatever you take, whether it's a cold tablet or a cold and flu tablet, which I probably need one now, but don't want to take one just in case, but um, those sort of things. All I was guilty of taking a book and to get a 12-month ban for that I thought was pretty harsh, but I did the wrong thing. So I was absolutely fuming at the time and I wanted to appeal because I thought I was a pretty harsh penalty for what uh, the crime was, for want of a better term. Um, in the end, I saw the effect it had on my parents, the effect it was having on me and my family, photographers jumping the fence uh, into our kids' school and she had to be sent home. I thought that was out of order, so I decided that I wasn't going to appeal, take the 12 months off and hopefully dedicate myself to fitness, spending a lot more time with the family. We went on an eight week holiday to Spain and England, which I haven't done for 15 years. So I think the model I've got today, um, you know, I, I think I'm more refreshed, I'm more relaxed, 12 months away from the game and in forced layoff, I didn't want to have that. Um, but now that I have had it and I'm approaching, you know, the, I suppose, the new chapter in my career. The Shane Warne story is not one of perpetual glory. Controversy and negative headlines have dogged his career. 
not here to talk about the last 12 months. I'm here to talk about Sri Lanka. I've been picked to tour and um, I'm pretty happy to be in that tour. A lot of it's been blown out of proportion. A lot of it's been my fault and I could have handled some things better as well. Um, but I don't know, there seems to be this fascination. You know, some other sportsmen do things and I've, I've always only worried about myself. But to put things in perspective, some other sports, high profile sportsmen do one thing and it gets in a, you know, 10 pages in from the sports section, the little section. Whatever happens in mine gets on the front and back page, so more people are aware of it. And that's out of my control. I can't control that. That's just my life. And I think one of the things that you have to come to terms with this day and age, when you're a high profile sportsman, is that the more you fight the negative press, the more you say, oh, get off my back, and all those sorts of things, then the more it eats away at you, the more you resent it. I think you just got to say, listen, it's part of it now. Although it might be a bit harsh or unfair, some of it, or a bit like uh, they're actually harassment on me, ha camping outside my house and following me wherever I go, jumping into my kids' school, those sorts of things. I think that's out of order, that's overstepping the line, but unfortunately it's part of it. And I think the more you just sort of say, oh, well, deal with it, just it's part of it, get on with it and just try and live your life, I think the more it doesn't eat away at you. And Looking back to certain things, like for instance, when you see vision of me dancing with a stump over my head, you think, oh look, he's showing off out the front. But what people don't understand, there was about a hundred or so Aussies on one side of the, side of the dressing room. And I think there was probably 50 poms outside on the other side, and that, well, which sounded like about 5,000. And they'd been into me for the whole five days. And they're all chanting my name at war. They're all saying, come outside, come outside. So we, a few of us got a stump from the game. So I started waving at it and they kept going and then I got pumped with the situation. It was sort of like, nah, nah, unlucky palms, you lost again. So it was sort of a bit of fun. It wasn't low, but then when you see it on the vision, I cringe when I see it, like, oh, what were you doing sort of thing on the vision. So look, I don't know. I look back at some of those things and I think, what were you thinking? But at the time it was sort of a bit of fun. So. I suppose, I don't think you'll see me doing that too many, I shouldn't say that because I probably will, but I don't think you'll see me doing those sorts of things again. Hopefully I've grown up a little bit since then. Where the scattering wickets were scandalising conservatives, like a bright comet, Shane Warne has cut a dazzling path through cricket's galaxy. It's been a trail adorned by magical feats, breathtaking skill, inspiring theater and not a little controversy but most of all it has been a story of courage a story about a bloke never afraid to step into the spotlight whenever the script demanded a miracle and in doing so he changed perceptions of leg spin bowling forever a lot of people say that uh, Warren is a very complicated man he's not he's a very simple man that uh, he enjoys simple things in life um, what he does do and what, he, what makes him different is he bowls leg spinners like no one else has been able to bowl leg spinners and that's what makes him very special. Ah! Oh, chance there for Gilchrist, he got them off pretty quickly. He took cricket I guess to a, a bit of a new level as part of a, a package, not just a great player on the field but a, he added rich glamour, excitement, uh, a bit of good old sort of Aussie larrikin. He's uh, annoyed a lot of people uh, in doing so, he knows that, he admits that, but, but it's Shane Warne, he's, he's pretty honest, he's pretty straight up front, so um, I think he'll be remembered as that, a guy that gave his best, loved every minute of it, but um, you know, was very, very talented as well. The thing that I most admire and respect of Shane Warne is that he hasn't changed um, as a person than what he was when I first met him 13 years ago. And you'd think a bloke with that much success um, would change a little bit, but uh, as I said, known him for 13 years and he's still the same bloke that he was. And uh, he looks after his own um, pretty well, and it'd be quite easy for him to think just to look after himself, but you know, he's constantly thinking of his friends and his family, and that puts, me, puts him right up there in my books. The thing that stands out for me is his friendship and his loyalty. He's still good friends, you know, Murph Hughes and myself have been friends with him for a long, long time. And it doesn't matter where in the world he is, he's always got time for you and he'll ring. You know, I've spoken to him in taxis in Mumbai, I've spoken to him in cable cars in South Africa, and he's always got time for his friends. And that's probably his most endearing feature, I think. With all his success, you know, and his fame, he hasn't changed one little bit. Anyone who knows him will tell you that. I think he just said he really brought crowds back to cricket, excited people about watching cricket. and. Um, 
and generated a whole young bunch of kids to go out there and bowl leg spin, which um, is something that hadn't been done probably since Bill O'Reilly. So, but just the enthusiasm that he, that he plays with and the love of the game. He does love the game. I think that's really important as well and sometimes can be overlooked. But um, he'll leave a legacy that, uh, you know, he's a once-in-a-lifetime bowler that a lot of people were very fortunate to actually see and play with. Oh, he's bowled him round his legs. Yes, he's got him round his legs. That's beautifully bowled. He'll be remembered as the best um, wrist spin bowler that's, um, that's ever been. There's no doubt about that. I mean, Clary Grimmett must have been marvellous, but when you see... Uh, worn, uh, and you see the old videos, the old footage, etc. You, you realise the athleticism of Warren, um, the accuracy, the nagging accuracy, the fact that he bowls on covered pitches, not uncovered pitches, and uh, he'll, he'll be remembered as as the best wrist spin bowler. I would like him to be remembered as the most successful spinner of all time, but I, I fear that uh, Mural Litter and the lurking behind uh, at the age of 30 might go past him. But I think to the average spin person, average cricket around the world, no matter how many wickets uh, Murali gets, I think Warm will always hold the number one mantle. I like to be remembered as a guy who never gave in, always gave 100% for his country and I think sort of helped change the way test cricket was viewed about uh, bringing another dimension rather than fast bowling to cricket. I think along with myself, Anil Kumble, Saklain Mushtak, Mural Litherin, between us, we've sort of made spin bowling a little bit more fashionable again and um, pretty entertaining for the crowd. So I think I'd like to be remembered to be a guy who always gave 100% for Australia and played his part in sort of reviving the art of spin bowling. Jane Warne made a triumphant return to Test cricket early in 2004. He took 26 wickets in the three-test tour of Sri Lanka, taking his 500th test wicket, and was declared man of the series. He's been absolutely superb for Australian cricket, world cricket. He's a super character, acknowledges the crowd. That is special stuff, Shane Warne. You are a champion.